Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Julio Robledo, and I'm the Quality Improvement and Reform Project Officer here at the Brisbane RPHN. I would like to welcome you to this first session on the Chronic Disease Management webinar series. And I would like to start by an acknowledgement to country. So I acknowledge the traditional custodians across the land in which we are meeting today. We acknowledge the waterways, the land, the sky. We acknowledge their ancestors and elders and recognize those who continue to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. We acknowledge the past and stand together for our future. So welcome everyone. A little bit of housekeeping. Everyone is gonna be mute, the camera off by default. If you have any questions during the session, please pop them up in the question and the Q&A box. We will do our best to come back to you in a couple of weeks time to answer all of those questions that you may have. At the end of the session, a uh, window will open automatically and there was, there's gonna be uh, a survey. I ask you to please kindly fill up the survey. This is gonna help us tailor our content and tailor these training opportunities to our region. And it's gonna help us also improve the quality of the training opportunities that we offer you guys. And there's gonna be a recording. This recording will be sent out to all the participants in the next couple of weeks, along as some of the resources that we're gonna be discussing in the session. Now, just this, a very small disclaimer for this particular session. The Australian government has deferred the implementation of changes to the chronic disease management items from the 1st of November, 2024 to the 1st of July, 2025. This webinar will still provide a brief overview of the information that is currently available and, uh, and everything in relation to the information that we have for the chronic uh, condition management. And I would like to introduce your speaker for tonight. Your speaker tonight is uh, the lovely Jane Kalijera. She's been with us for a couple of times now. She is from CDM Plus and provides different training opportunities. So welcome, Jane. And without further ado, let's, let's continue with the session. Thanks, Julia. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Um, so as Julia said, we've got uh, two webinars as part of this Chronic Disease Management webinar series. Um, tonight we're going to do the little bit of the Medicare update. We were hoping it was going to coincide with those updates, but um, unfortunately that's been postponed. So we'll talk about uh, what's happened in the last six months with the Medicare item numbers um, that you might not have been aware of. Um, and we'll also talk about um, those changes that will be coming in and where to find that information on MBS. So we'll have a quick look at that together. Um, so hopefully, hopefully at the end of this, um, you'll be able to identify the CDM MBS numbers as they stand right now um, and be able to implement Oh, there was a couple of changes uh, with the First Nations um, Australians as well. So the after that 715 health check, uh, they're actually eligible for those 10 allied health services per calendar year. Um, and one of the resources that we'll have available for you has that in the flow chart. So um, I'll show you the resources that you'll have available um, after this session through an online portal. Um, and that's really good because as those changes coming next year, um, we'll have our updated resources that you'll be able to access as well. So I guess the good thing about this for the, the 715 health checks is that the patients don't have to have a chronic condition to be able to access all 10. Um, so I think that's a really good um, change that came into place as well. Uh, for those clinics that work with nurse practitioners, um, so nurse practitioners have been added to the list of eligible allied health professionals for the case conferences, which was really exciting as well. Still time-based um, as all the other providers, like the GPs and other allied health providers. So that's um, a really good bonus as well for those that are working with um, nurse practitioners as part of their, their chronic condition management with patients. The heart health check also had a couple of little changes in the explanatory notes. So 
it can actually be claimed uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders if they've had a 715 in that previous 12 months. Um, the explanatory notes before that change, um, with, they weren't allowed to have um, a previous health check. So as an example, um, if we did the 715, it would kind of bounce back with the 699 and vice versa. So that was really good. There's been some changes with the other health assessments as well. So for those guys that did or took part in the webinar that we did back in May, these were with the July changes as well. So the time tiered health checks, um, patients can actually receive um, each health assessment uh, for which they're eligible for. So no minimum interval um, of time between those. So they've got some examples in Medicare. If we've got time, uh, we can have a look at that together. But I do recommend jumping back in to have a read um, of those descriptions because that's where we've got those um, explanatory notes and examples that they've got in there. So the example that they've got there um, is a patient with the type 2 diabetes risk evaluation and a health assessment for intellectual disability. So when we talk about setting up our practices with processes, now that there's been some changes around some of these health assessments, um, it's a really good time, um, I guess, to sit down as a team and, and decide what that looks like from a workflow point of view, what you're going to do with your reminders um, and next appointments. And then the last one, so uh, November 24, was the removal of the arrangements between the eligible midwives and nurse practitioners um, and medical practitioners to prescribe. So that was really exciting as well. So that's just a little brief update. As I said, I do recommend jumping in and having a closer look, especially at the health assessment um, sections, uh, just to cover those changes that have happened and then access those resources that you'll have available um, as digital um, to be able to look at the flow charts for allied health, et cetera, um, and some of those workflows. Uh, one of the other changes uh, with the PIP Indigenous Health Incentive, um, the outcome payments um, now include the under 15, the mental health treatment plans have been added, um, the service delivery is no longer tied to the calendar year. So for those that have been doing this for a while, we used to get the outcome payments in February. Um, so the last bit, it just kind of, as soon as they've hit that target level, the outcome payment will get paid in that next quarter. Um, and then going forward, no longer needing um, to re-register patients um, annually. So that lifetime registration automatically um, applied from the 1st of January. So that was exciting as well. <laughs> One less bit of paper. Uh, the next little bit, I guess, was just, as Julio said, the, the chronic disease management reform um, has just been uh, pushed till the 1st of July. I think it's probably good because it gives us a little bit of time to um, set up and prepare with my Medicare and some of the other processes that we need to get ready. So I'm going to show you where to find those changes. Um, so even after this webinar, like if you watch this, you know, next year, or you'll be able to see um, where to jump in and have a look at those news updates as they come through. I guess the good thing, uh, I guess when we do all the training, everyone always has a little bit of confusion around the GP management plan and the team care arrangements. So I was pretty excited that, um, that we may be heading towards like a single um, chronic condition management plan. Um, equalising the fees and uh, for the developing and the review of the, the plans um, and then accessing the CDM items for my Medicare enrolled patients. So I think between now and when these other changes come in, we need to make sure that we've enrolled our patients um, in the my Medicare. I think a lot of future activities will be tied to this. So they've released some new resources. We'll have a look together with the um, my Medicare resources that they've released. Um, and then the patients will need to have a CDM plan that's been created or reviewed in that last 18 months to be able to access the allied health services. Um, Paperwork-wise and things like that uh, with those processes, not quite sure uh, what will happen there, but it's a kind of watch this space as we go through. Um, and then there was a talk around the patients will only need to have um, a CDM plan uh, to be able to access a home medicine review. Now, the home medicine review we're going to talk about in the next session. 
Um, the next session is really good, especially for a lot of newbies that might not have put a care plan together on their own um, or kind of new to general practice. So we're going to be doing a care plan demonstration um, and we'll look at the home medicine review at the same time. Um, and then obviously there'll be a transition across um, the arrangements to obviously make sure that the patients are able to access their care um, across those different services or existing services that they had in place. So I'm just going to show you quickly now on the Medicare site. So that should just come straight up to Medicare. So MBS Online, um, if you just jump in on that home page, they've actually got that main section here where we always find the COVID um, information. So I think just keep your eye on this home page. They'll update. A lot of the updates happen monthly. Um, so if you've never jumped on here for any news updates, then just click on the news and you'll actually see them there month by month. So um, I think just jump between there and the fact sheets. So I usually check out the news page first, um, jump through, and then you'll see, I guess, the highlights of new numbers or or things that may be relevant for general practice. So not everything's um, specifically just for um, general practice. It's a lot of hospital and pathology, other item numbers, et cetera, as well. So, um, so yeah, that's how to stay up to date uh, with some of those changes that are coming. With a lot of the training that we've done over the last, um, you know, three, six months, even last year, um, a lot of clinics are at different levels of uh, my Medicare. So some have actually started the registration process with um, their patients and, you know, the residents in aged care that they're looking after as well. Uh, the registration for my Medicare is a voluntary. Just put some of the little highlight of the uh, newer resources, uh, which I thought were really good, the new um, like First Nations uh, resources that they've released, the toolkit that's been... Um, out for a little bit as well. Um, so, and the frequently asked questions document, I guess they're my um, top three. So have a look if you haven't started this process. As I said, I think the chronic condition management items are all going to be linked um, going forward um, to my Medicare. So I think if we can get that part of our um, processes ready and, and completed, um, and for those that look after aged care, you may need some help from the um, aged care homes as well to um, get that in place and, and finalise. So as I said, everyone's kind of in a different stage of um, setup from when uh, we were able to register patients from this time last year, basically. So um, the patient eligibility, they need a valid um, Medicare or DVA card, um, have had two face-to-face -face appointments with that practice in the last 24 months. Um, and then for some remote, it's just the, the one. Um, the prep practice needs to be accredited um, or an um, ARCHO or Aboriginal Medical Service, nurse practitioner-led practice with the GP or any others. So at the moment, uh, the My Medicare like registration with the clinic, it gives the, the GPs in aged care um, incentives um, for the CDM items linked um, to the patient's registration. So at the moment, it's the longer MBS funded telephone calls, the triple bulk billing incentives for the longer MBS consults as well um, for children under 16 pensions, uh, pensioners and concession card holders. So watch this space. As I said, I think as uh, time goes on, just more will um, kind of be linked um, in the background to these. So when we talk about our chronic disease management processes, uh, for me, it's all about that long-term delivery and care for patients that have one or more chronic conditions. So um, I'm going to say care plans, care plan reviews um, while we still can until um, next July. But at, as we know, a lot of these patients with one or multiple conditions need lots of follow-up visits. So um, the review period um, between clinics is really different as well. Um, most clinics will do three months. Some clinics do six months. Um, it, for me, it, it depends on the patient. So if they've got um, especially a couple of chronic conditions um, on those more complex patients, I prefer the three-month review period. And we'll talk about the, the review when we do the care plan um, in a little bit more detail on next week's webinar. Uh, and then health assessments. So with those changes with health assessments, 
I think that makes it really accessible uh, for a lot of our patients that we might not have seen yet for some of these activities. Um, it just allows us to target those groups. So a lot of patients will be able to have at least one health assessment in a 12 month period, which I think is great. So have a look at those time tiered. We'll talk about some of the other ways that we can flag um, patients as they're coming through the clinic in other um, situations like the treatment room as an example. Um, so let me just jump to this one. Uh, so this is uh, increased with this year's reporting. So six in 10 patients have a, a chronic condition. A lot of the patients that we'll see for the care plans will have multiple um, conditions. And I think the mental health uh, conditions go hand in hand with um, a lot of the other chronic conditions that we see coming through. So the place that I like to start when we're starting to look at chronic disease management is how many patients um, your clinic has and what those workflows look like. So a lot of clinics will have processes set up for every other part of their practice except the chronic condition management. So um, this is really important. It's going to be dependent on a lot of things, including how many staff you have on the ground. Um, and we'll talk about those different practice team roles. So I think it's really important to discuss that as a team, especially if the clinic is wanting to grow um, and increase the revenue side of the, the chronic disease management, because the better the process, the better the outcome um, for the patients and for the clinic. So I've got a couple of little quick cheat sheets for you. Uh, you'll actually be able to access our um, billing sheets, billing combinations as well um, as part of the, the resources that you'll get as um, part of this webinar as well. So let me just jump through to the quick little um, cheat sheet. So I've got links. They'll go straight to the Medicare for those descriptions. So as I said, if you haven't read the updates around um, the time tiered health assessments and the 715 um, and the heart health check, definitely jump and have a look at those. Um, and then we've also included the mental health numbers in that little quick little cheat sheet. A lot of our patients with chronic conditions uh, that have the GP management plan or team care arrangement may also have um, a mental health plan in place as well. So it depends on the patient. Um, the other item numbers that we do see a lot of will depend on the different uh, equipment that you may have available. So I've just put some of the really common ones that's just from some of our advanced resources and set up um, that we do with some clinics. So it's going to come down to what um, additional equipment that you have um, in your clinic. That telehealth support number is one of the original uh, telehealth numbers, so the 10983. Um, so some clinics do this really well. That item number has been around since 2014. Um, so they actually have a dedicated telehealth room. This is where the nurse or Aboriginal health workers actually um, sitting with the patient uh, while they're on a, a specialist appointment. So um, they can actually work really well um, in some of the workflows. As I said, it's going to come down to how many resources, how much space you have in your clinic um, to be able to dedicate um, to some of these activities. Uh, the ABI spirometry, um, ECG and the ambulatory like blood pressure monitoring as well will come down to um, the equipment and workflows. So when we do the care plan demo next week, you'll see how we make the list of what needs to go into this plan. And the plan for me is everything that needs to happen in the next 12 months. So if it's our patient with asthma, then we're looking at, you know, we need to do a spirometry, we need to do a review, we might need to do some other um, screening activities as well. So depending on their risk factors, et cetera. So the other little quick little cheat sheet that we've got through as well um, was just around some of the follow-up numbers. So that 10997 that you can see uh, for the practice nurse or AHP follow-up service, I know a lot of clinics use the face-to-face, -face, but I just wanted to um, make everyone aware that the, the GP, like the telehealth one, um, for the practice nurse um, or AHP is still valid. So that's uh, whether it's like the video conference or the phone as well. So that might be more suitable for some of your patients that, you know, can't get back into the clinic, um, but we need to chase up, you know, something around um, their care plan. So 
that's also available for the 10987. So there's a video conference and a, um, a telephone one as well. So that's just our quick little um, cheat sheet for some of the, the billing pathways once some of those plans are in place. And then we've popped the annual veteran um, check numbers there as well for you. The PMPs, the prescribed medical practitioner numbers in that last column um, as well. So for clinics that have the non-VR doctors working with them as well, then you can have a look at those um, descriptions. So it's slightly less um, money for the same activities. So one of the best tips that I can give um, clinics is to actually define the team roles and tasks to promote teamwork um, and increase efficiency. Anyone that's ever done training with me before knows that I don't like paperwork and I'm not very good at typing. You'll see next week when we do our care plan demo. Um, but for me, it helps us onboard um, new staff that are coming through. Um, the clinic, so it might be like new registrars, new nurses, um, even admin that are coming through the clinic. There's so many different things that we need to be able to do. It really helps um, the team to actually have a written process in place. One of the resources you will have access to uh, will be our chronic disease management manual, and that's got a step-by-step, -step, which we'll follow um, to do a care plan uh, next week. So everything becomes a process. So um, a process for any of the CDM activities. So we're going to talk about the care plan review and, and health assessments, but everything kind of starts with a, what happens before the appointment, what happens during the appointment, and then what needs to happen after the appointment. Uh, and so when you actually write down these workflows, you might find that some of your clinical staff are doing admin tasks and vice versa, like as in, I, from my experience, a lot of the nursing team are usually doing more admin processes than what needs to happen, like pro to checks and eligibility and things like that. So I prefer to hand anything admin um, over to the admin team um, to look after that. But as I said, a lot of this will depend on how many resources you actually have on the ground. So reception play a really, really important role. Um, when I talk about chronic disease management, I'm after long-term solutions. So I don't want something to just work for a couple of months and then it falls apart, you know, because we actually leave, um, like a staff member leaves or, or something changes. We want something that even if a new staff member um, started or there was a change in our team, the process could continue on because it's documented. Um, so for me, admin play a part as in confirming the appointment. Um, checking the eligibility, um, and that will depend on your practice and resources of how many eligibility checks uh, will happen. I prefer um, all this to be done, like that's the, the nurses and the GPs, um, and a full patient list can take anywhere from, you know, 15 minutes or so to do. So that's why I said it, it depends on your um, staff levels. If you're low on staff, I would just make sure the bare minimum that you have uh, the nurse list completed because they'll see a lot of people through that treatment room um, as well. So that's something to discuss. Um, updating the patient details and any of your patient registration processes can start at admin. Um, so this is something that if it's not running smoothly now or there's things missing, this is something to you know, really get sorted um, as we, we're heading to the new year. So um, so you can kind of kickstart, you know, 2025. So you're ready with your CDM processes. The changes that are going to happen shouldn't really affect these big processes we're, we're talking about now. So the today, the next appointment, um, and the actual process of putting a plan together, yes, some of the language and item numbers will change, um, but I don't think the actual processes as a whole um will be much different from what we're currently doing. If anything, I'm hoping it will be a little bit easier. Um, so nurses and Aboriginal health workers play a really important role as well. So we're usually collecting all of that information um, for the GP to review and, and putting that document together um, for review. So whether that's the care plan, um, the review or health check, uh, and it might be that we're actually coordinating that care for some of the more complex patients. So it might be uh, we're setting up some of those uh, referrals 
um, et cetera, or follow-up appointments, whatever needs to happen for um, that particular patient. So it just depends on um, that workflow and staff levels as well. The GP, really, really important as well. So the main, main um main coordinator, reviewing all of the information that's put together, arranging and um, following up with any investigations, et cetera. And so that next appointment workflow um, is really important to discuss with your GPs. So everyone's on the same page. So if it's your diabetic patients that you're seeing every three months, what's that process look like? And I think it can be difficult, especially when you've got multiple GPs um, in a practice, multiple nurses in a practice, the bigger the team, um, I guess the the differences can happen in the dynamics as in, um, you know, uh, preferences with templates or different processes and, and things like that. I prefer to get everyone together to actually discuss and look at, you know, the current templates, what's working well, what's not, so we can kind of put a list together and um, make them a bit better and the efficiency of, of the documentation part because I don't like the, the paperwork side. Um, so that's a really important part. You'll get our templates as well. So that's really exciting. You can bring them into your um, software. So we've got them for best practice, um, medical director and communicator. After the appointment uh, is a really important part and especially the communication between the nurse um, or Aboriginal health worker and the GP back to reception. And this is going to come around um, about your billing. So best practice is actually quite easy with the billing side of it, um, depending on what your practices have set up as a process. As an example, I've worked in clinics where um, I've been asked to put my item numbers in. So as an example, if I saw the patient and I did a follow-up service, um, I was actually putting in the, the item numbers. And the good thing about it is I can write my comments to like reception, you know, to book next appointment, you know, for care plan review or whatever it might, might be in three months. So it actually makes it really easy um, from a communication point of view with the team. So um, as admin go to finalise that visit, at reception, they're actually going to see um, my message come up. So bring it across. Um, so when admin go to finish that billing, they'll actually see my message pop straight up. And this is really important because we don't want to annoy admin. You can imagine how many, um, you know, different things they've got going on at any one time at the counter. So it can be really stressful if we're ringing and kind of continuing like up to the front desk to kind of ask them uh, to do something, especially you picture that when you've got 10 doctors, four nurses, like it's um, a lot for admin. So I think any way that we can improve the communication about the billing and the next appointments, um, if it was a medical director Praxsoft, uh, the waiting room, little comment sections are quite good for that as well. Um, you also get access to our billing sheet. So for clinics that prefer a billing sheet that they can kind of circle the item number, um, then that's an option as well that you'll be able to um, download and use those resources as well. So this can take a little, this whole nutting out that patient journey within the clinic can take a little bit um, sometimes to get right and it might be a little bit of trial and error. Um, and think about the things that, you will need to set up in the background. So if you're starting out heart health checks and you've never done that before, as an example, you might look at things like an appointment type that's not set up and how long does, you know, um, that patient need with the nurse, how long with the GP, um, what does that workflow look like if they've got to have blood, blood tests before? So is it something that the GP will flag um, and then they'll come back into the clinic um, and see the nurse um, in that follow-up appointment with the results? Um, or is it something that we do the reverse of that and bill it when the patient comes back for their results. So the nurse will see them on that first day as an example. So they're all really important because then everyone understands their role um, in that process. So I talk through those main three appointment types, so the care plan reviews and the different types of health assessments, um, just so you have a very clear process on what that looks like. 
make a big to-do list of what needs to happen. And it might be like um, updating the templates or, you know, reviewing those appointment types. So if you're doing that as a clinical and admin meeting um, together, then it might be that, you know, different team members get um, tasks and things allocated from there. My favourite little bit is updating um, and making our, our clinical sof software really efficient. So you're actually going to get access to a couple of our um, resources. One of them will be um, our text shortcuts. So you can just kind of copy and paste them in um, to your text shortcuts. I'll show you a couple of those um, next week when we go to do our um, care plan demo. But I think it's a really great way. I can't remember everything um, and the way the item numbers change and, and things like that, it, it actually makes it really hard um, to document well for a Medicare part of it. So I want to make sure that this is my little prompt um, and then I'll delete what hasn't been done and write my notes next to what I've actually completed um, for that patient. So I find the text shortcuts really, really helpful. Um, so you'll have access uh, to those as well. and our templates that will have the instructions on how to um, bring them in. You'll get access to our CDM Plus manual, which has um, the six chapters. Um, it'll go through the care plan, uh, review, health assessments, um, and the home medicine uh, review in a step-by-step -step process. So you don't have to do the processes as we do them, but use it as a reference if you don't have a, a chronic disease management process set up in your clinic. Um, the digital version that you'll get will actually um, have links that you can click into. And as I said, as you'll have access to this uh, for the 12 months, you'll be able to have the new version um, when they come out um, for July as well. And then the other resource that you'll get access to will be the flowchart. So this is our health assessment um, flowchart. Um, you'll have the updated uh, one around the access to allied health as well. So those 10 individual allied health services, or five and five, which is how we've known it for the last little bit as well. So that's our two little flow charts. Uh, the billing sheets are really popular with some clinics. It's going to come down to the processes that um, your clinic wants to implement I find a lot of people can't remember all the item numbers like me. Um, so I'm a big fan of even if I don't use that as a billing sheet to kind of circle and send back out to reception, it's my quick little cheat sheet so I can have a quick look at the item number and um, type it in. So uh, we've got a couple of different ones um, available in that portal that you can um, use. They're all as PDFs and things like that um, in the background. So um, one of the other popular resources is our MBS billing combination. So a lot of the item numbers that we do use for chronic disease management um, can be billed together. So knowing what they are, um, a lot of the rejections will actually happen because of the notations that aren't documented um, in the service text. So um, that's a really important thing to talk about um, from a major Maybe practice management side um, to just maybe do a review if uh, certain item numbers are kind of bouncing back all the time. Let's look at the um, rejection codes and, and find out what's happening. Um, sometimes it's something quite simple, but those batches are checked by computer on the other end. So we just want to make sure that um, we're not accepting rejection that um, didn't need to um, be rejected. So once we've updated everything in our, our clinical software from templates to text shortcuts and appointment types, um, it's time to look at the patient engagement. So a lot of clinics will say to me they find it easy to get the patient in for that initial care plan, um, but it's hard to get them back in for one of the follow-up um, appointments and they'll get a lot of non-attendance rates and things like that. So um, I'm a big fan of a, point, a, a process called the next appointment um, and we use it for all of our um, activities. So the next appointment process um, can be really helpful um, from a patient engagement point of view. Um, the way we use 
that for a lot of activities is once the patients actually finish the care plan or review or health assessment, um, I'll, as a nurse, so I'll explain to the patient that because of their diabetes and their care plan, we'll be seeing them like quite regularly, like throughout that um, 12 months. Um, and so I'll let them know when that review date is as you know, we've discussed as, as a team. So as an example, if it's a diabetic patient, we usually see them every um, three months and I'll get that patient to book on the way out. And we usually get reception to frame the question to the patient um, in a certain way. So instead of saying, you know, can I book your next appointment out at reception? Um, we usually get reception to say something along the lines of, you know, I need to book your next uh, care plan review, you know, what day suits you better. Um, and that gives the ownership back to the patient. They can decide the day, time, et cetera, that they want to book. It also isn't a yes or no question. So um, they're actually more likely to turn up to that appointment if they book it themselves. So that's something to have a look at um, and reviewing your DNA rates just to see uh, what that looks like. Um, as someone that does not like paperwork, you can imagine what the next appointment process does to my reminder list. Um, it becomes a very, very little. <laughs> um, the reminders is something we usually hand off to admin um, to complete in a lot of the practices I work with, um, and it becomes a tick and flick list. So as an example, if we're doing 25 you know, care plans uh, a week, that's 100 a month. Imagine if 100 patients were already booked in three months' time. Or if you're doing it over 75s and, you know, all those patients are booked back in in 12 months' time. It just makes our jobs a little bit easier. The patients have kind of take, taken part in that process. Um, it's just really hard to get hold of patients once they've left the clinic. And so if they've got the reminder process set up uh, once they're booked in, it just makes it a bit easier. Um, and it's also hard to get appointments. So if we've actually got um, that patient booked in um, ahead of time, they usually get the date, the time, the doctor um, that they're wanting to book in with. Um, and so they're happier um, that way as well. So it actually delays that management. So if we send out reminders today um, for patients to come in, they'll due for the review in November and we're sending it that out now, um, most clinics are booked, you know, six, eight weeks ahead. So we're actually delaying management if we don't book the next appointment. From a, a practice um, and owner uh, perspective, so from the organisation itself, um, it actually increases the financial sustainability of the practice. So it makes it really hard for clinics to um, predict revenue coming in with an empty appointment book. So if we have our CDM list, um, uh, for the nurses working CDM and the, the GPs, um, we've got that um, all booked in, you know, three, six, 12 months down the track. It gives the organisation an opportunity to plan a little bit better, especially from a HR point of view where they might be, you know, looking at onboarding, you know, as an example, if I was a CDM nurse, I was fully booked. Um, you know, no one can book in for another, you know, three months. They can see that ahead of time. Um, they're actually going to recruit a little bit earlier. So it actually makes it um, really good for everyone. So it's great for the patient um, because they're taking more ownership with their care. It's great for the um, kind of reminder and, and paper trail process to get patients back into the clinic and decreases the um, DNAs. And then from an organisation, it actually um, can help them grow um, as an organisation uh, financially as well. So we focus on these three different types of appointments, but you can use it for anything. Um, you know, if someone's in for a wound or, a, you know, B12 or, you know, a, another type of appointment that needs to be rebooked. Um, as I said, the engagement rate um, is a lot higher when we do it when they're in the clinic. So we usually focus on the care plan. So they're coming for a care plan. We book the review. They're coming for a health assessment. As I said, most adults will be able to, have at least a health assessment every 12 months. So our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders can have health checks every nine months. Um, and then with our time tiered and heart health checks, um, if we go between those health assessments, that's uh, at least every 12 months for, for most patients. So um, I would be booking those in um, as well. And then for patients that have a mental health plan um, in place, 
this is also something that a lot of uh, GPs and clinics have flagged to us like uh, previously that they have no problem getting a patient in for a mental health plan, but it's getting them back for the review. So that initial mental health plan, the referral um, allows patients to have six uh, visits, but if that review number isn't billed, then it doesn't trigger the remaining four um, that they're eligible for. So um, it's really important that we have that uh, review as well. So deciding that time frame um, and try and just think of the, the most common situation. So most of our patients with mental health plan review, uh, mental health plans will have the review in X number of months. So the minimum is four weeks. Um, most clinics I work with go between the three and six months, depending on the patient. So some of the big challenges that I normally see is, um, especially from a nurse and sometimes the GP as well, like is we're trying to do everything today. Um, and sometimes today overshadows the next 12 months. And so we get stuck doing what the patient needs to have done today, but we're not looking at um, that bigger picture. And so I think for me that the chronic disease management became a lot more enjoyable Um when I looked at it from another point of view. So sometimes we can only do that one or, or two things that day that that patient uh, might be in the clinic, but that next appointment is what's going to allow us to complete everything they need in that 12 months. Um, and so I've got a couple of case studies that we'll go through just to have a look at what that um, looks like. <laughs> Let me jump across. So I've got Stuart. Um, he's a 42-year-old uh, man that comes into the clinic for some wound care. So it's coming through the, the treatment room. Um, or it might be a patient that the GP's seen and then ask the, the nurse to do a dressing. Um, so smoker, overweight, um, history of asthma and hypertension uh, in the billing um, info, no health assessments and no care plans in place. So I try to look at everything from what would I do um, today? What would I do as the next appointment for this uh, particular patient? And what care does that patient need over the next 12 months? Um, and then from an MBS item number, what numbers can be billed? So uh, if I was a nurse working treatment room, I always have a quick look at the billing history before I call a, a patient in. Um, and even if I was CDM nurse um, for the day, I'd still do it like that as well. So when we talk about the eligibility checks and things, um, you know, if this was a patient coming through the treatment room, we would usually document the eligibility checks in that appointment note section in um, best practice. In uh, Praxoff, we'd normally do it in the little note section um, as well. So I always want to have a quick look to see what's in place. Um, I'll open the billing history as well. Um, mine's a fake patient, so there's not much in there. Um, but I'd have a quick look to just see if there was a care plan or health assessment like in place, um, because that will tell me whether I can build that follow-up item number. So um, if the patients come in today for wound care, I'm a fan of doing what we need to do. Um, so most likely, you know, I don't have longer than, you know, 10 minutes or so um, to do a, a wound, depending on, on what wound it is. So I'm going to do what I need to today, but I'm going to, you know, talk to Stuart and just say, look, I can see you've got um, asthma. Let's get you back in for your um, care plan. Because if we look at this patient um, over the next 12 months, when I'm putting the asthma care plan together, um, I'm actually going to be putting this big list of things that we need to do in the next 12 months. Um, some of them are really quick. Some of them are just some of the, you know, screening tools because of the, the risk factors that he um, has, you know, for COPD, um, heart disease, et cetera. So we're not going to be able to do everything in the next 12 months today. And I think once we realise that, uh, chronic disease management becomes a little bit easier and I think especially once they get more than a couple of chronic conditions, it becomes really hard um, to prioritise sometimes. So you actually need that time in the care plan to put everything down and then prioritise that list. And that's what we're going to do next week um, in that care plan demonstration. 
So yeah, the next appointment, uh, whether you guys um, in your clinics would do the wound and care plan together and not bill for the like, wound that way, it just depends on your billing processes. Some clinics would book it as two separate appointments, which is how I've got it. Uh, Kevin, 74-year-old man that's coming for some scripts, um, cardiovascular disease um, on uh, eight medications, no care plan, no health check. So same thing, what are we actually going to do today? Um, in with the nurse, it's probably for a blood pressure check and um, basic screen before uh, he sees the GP. So from our point of view, um, today is basically going to be a blood pressure check. He'll get the scripts from the GP. Um, he needs a couple of appointments booked. So even though he's 74, I would actually book him or I'd get admin to book on the way out um, the over 75 health check um, and I'd get him to book in for the care plan for cardiovascular. So even though he might not turn 75 till next June, um, I'm still going to lock that appointment in so I don't have to chase up um, a patient when we look at the um, recall and reminder list. Um, and I stopped when we got to the bottom of the table, but, you know, this is what the 12 months, you know, all the things that we need to do um, for this patient in that next 12 months. So it's going to take time to put that list together and then prioritise and get them back for that um, appointment after that care plan and, and work our way through the list. And then our last one, we've got Stacey, so 45-year-old woman that's in for a flu injection, um, so coming through the treatment room, First Nations, ex-smoker, on blood pressure and cholesterol medication, last seven, one, five, 12 months ago, no care plan. So same thing, a flu injection appointment is probably not the longest appointment on, on record. So a lot of the times we won't have time to do anything else but what they've come in for. But as I said, if I have a quick look in the billing history, quick look to see what's already in place, it gives me an idea of what I can book next and what I can build today. So I've just got there that we do a, a flu shot. Depending on the organisation you work for, I've worked with a lot of Aboriginal medical services. So if that was the scenario, a lot of the times we have longer appointments that we can um, take the opportunity to do an opportunistic 715. That's not going to happen in a lot of um, mainstream clinics. So today it will most likely just be the flu injection and then we'll get the patient to walk back in for the 715. And so even though this patient technically doesn't have any uh, chronic conditions at the moment, we still need a lot of follow-up appointments. So a lot of those will be routine screening, so cervical screening, breast screening, et cetera, um, and then some of the other screening tools for things like COPD, um, cardiovascular risk, et cetera. So that next 12 months still looks quite long, doesn't it, even though um, that's kind of the list that we're putting together in that 715 health check. So even after that 715 has been completed, we're going to need a, a couple of follow-up appointments um, after that as well. So with the 715s, we'd normally book in for the week after um, for the bloods and I might tie in a couple of those. So I might book a nurse um, or Aboriginal health worker and GP appointment um, to just cover some of those additional screenings um, at the same time. So I hope that helps. That's some of our little top tips for your processes. Um, the other top tip is just the training. So once we've got everything set up, we need to think about how we're going to um, onboard and, and update staff um, as we go. So you've actually got the um, digital resources that, that you'll be able to look at um, some of our processes and, and have some resources there for your clinic. And then you'll get a copy of the slides as part of this uh, webinar series as well. So you'll actually get in the toolkit everything you need to set up these processes. So you'll get our introduction um, online modules You'll get the templates for your software with the instructions on how to import them into your clinical software. You'll get our tech shortcuts um, and those digital resources that we had a look at. So I hope that helps um, get everyone up and running for uh, chronic disease management. For those that haven't registered uh, for next week's um, webinar, I suggest you jump in. We're going to uh, do a demonstration on how to perform a care plan. We're going to talk about care plan reviews. Um, and we're going to look at some of the tech shortcuts as well.
that's it from me. If there's any questions, I know yes. we've got a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, Jean, for, for this wealth of knowledge. It's a lot to digest. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. It's, it's been an, uh, a great session. And I guess it, under, it really underpins the importance of having that shift in mindset and having that opportunistic approach and, and thinking about the long term. And I guess from the PHM perspective, remember that a lot of these processes are actually quality improvement. So reach out to your engagement officers, reach out to the PHN, and we're more than happy to help you through this journey of uh, setting up your chronic disease management um, plans. So um, quick, quick reminder, please help us with the, with the survey. A survey is going to pop up when we close the session. Uh, as I said, this, this survey helps us really understand what are the needs in, in our region. For example, if there's training opportunities or you guys are looking at upskilling your own staff, you can let us know and we can see if we can find a, a way where we can upskill our regions. So please answer the survey. It's really important for us. It also helps us improve the quality of the sessions that we deliver. So please, please, please answer the survey. Uh, if you have any questions, please pop them a, in the q and I've got there one there. I'll answer if you want, Julio. Like, um, oh, someone just uh, popped a, a question in uh, just around, like, um, asking like they're, they're assuming like there'll be no update until mid-year about the changes to the care plans um i think it will happen a little bit sooner than that like when medicare actually do the updates um if you go into that news section um like regularly they'll actually um start putting into the july a lot earlier and um, we'll have a little bit more information with fact sheets and things, I think, a little bit earlier. So um, I think it'll be my guess is my best guess. Um, I'm, I'm thinking from about March we'll start to hear um, a lot more information, if not um, like more than the fact sheet that we had uh, before um, they postponed. So I think there'll be a lot more coming out Um Every yeah, month, and, and I regarding sharing information, um, keep an eye on your inbox uh, because we have a newsletter a practice link which uh, we are uh, sharing information and we also have uh, some other uh, newsletter where we share all the information that we have up to date to my Medicare. So, you know, just keep an eye on your inbox. If you're not receiving those emails, reach out to the PHN and we're happy to um help you subscribe to these newsletters. And we have another question about, uh, are we automatically registered? Unfortunately, no, there are two separate registrations links. Um, what I'll do is uh, we can send you, Matthew, uh, the registration link. Barbara, okay. But yes, there are two different registration links. So you are not automatically uh, subscribe let's say to the next session so if you if you haven't already please um go back to your emails there's going to be two different registration codes so please register and um if there's any other questions if we can answer them now we will answer them now if we can't answer them now we will uh answer the questions we would send the, the resources and the recording so please uh ask your questions and as i said please help us with the survey okay. We have another question. Um, when the nurse does the follow-up call to patient um, five annually, is it a 93023? They bill through or 10997? Are you able to see the question, Jane? Yeah, the follow-up number will be the telephone number. So it's the equivalent of the face-to-face, -face, but the telephone. So it just depends how your clinic um, wants to use those numbers. So. Yeah, it can be a, a combination of those face to face and the phone. Um, I don't have many clinics doing the video conference, but the phone um, and face to face are um, usually the main ones. The phone's really good for some of those more complex patients or immunocompromised or mobility and you know other issues and things like that. So I think it's it's good to keep that into the mix. So. Um. There's another question. Yeah, so 715 um, doesn't exclude eligibility for other 701, 707. 
um, does the 701 exclude vice versa? So it was really interesting with the Medicare changes, Matthew. So what they brought in, um, I might actually just bring that page up because we've got a bit of... So it's basically saying that if someone's eligible for multiple, then they can have them, which I think it's going to cause a bit of chaos um, myself as a process. So that's why I said go back and read it with the um, team together. So I'm just going to scroll down uh, where they've added these extra bits in. So how do I choose which um, health assessment uh, to do? Um, my patient is eligible for more than one category. Uh, which health assessment should I do? Patients can receive each health assessment they are eligible for, for example, and that's the one that I gave. Um, the 42-year-old the that has an intellectual um, disability also has a high risk of developing type 2, um, so they can actually receive the health assessment for the intellectual disability and their type 2 diabetes. So this is where it becomes really, really important um, in the notations when you're actually billing multiple numbers. So as an example, say you did the um, 705 for the intellectual disability, um, I would actually be putting that in the notation. So if you're using BP, um, I'll just get rid of that number. So say it was the 705, see where this service text is. If you just double click on that, I'd actually be putting the actual type of um, health assessment in there as well. And that's just because from the other end, as I said, it's um, checked by computer, um, all the batches that go to Medicare. So if we haven't got the notation, you haven't notated at the time, like just different things like that, you'll get, there's like over 200 reason, reasons for rejection. So um, because you can do that now from the health assessment point of view, I would be starting to document uh, which time-tiered health assessment you're doing. So I think it's going to cause a bit more confusion um, going forward, especially like you want it to have value, I guess, for a patient to come back in um, as well. So for me, if they were eligible for a couple of um, health assessments, I would be looking at maybe doing one maybe a couple of weeks you know, 12 weeks later, as an example. So it's at least a couple months for some changes to have happened, you know, to reduce risk factors and all those things that we're looking at um, in a health assessment. So as I said, discuss this as a team because it's going to impact your workflows um, quite a bit. Um, I hope that answers, Matthew. I know it's a bit um, confusing, but they've actually got um, some extra information and things. It, it's more than they've ever actually put in the, the health assessment explanatory notes. So, um, yeah, I think that's definitely worth um, having a look at. Uh, Sharon's popped a, a question in as well, uh, just around can a 109 and 7 be built on the same day as a 721-723? Look, when a lot of the care plans first came out years and years and years ago, um, we automatically did them. There's some clinics that still do. Um, the correspondence we've received from Medicare over the years um, and on our resources, we've got a, a kind of a cross with an asterisk um, against it, and it's because the correspondence we've received has said it's more of a follow-up once the plan's in place. So um, as an example, if I've put that we're doing, you know, blood pressures every, you know, six weeks for a patient in that care plan, then I'm using that as part of the follow-up. So I prefer to link it back um, to the actual plan. So while we've, just let me pop the item number in so we can have a look together. Um, so this is the main description of that item number um, and the bit that I think is really, really important from an audit point of view is that the service is consistent with what we've got in the plan. And so in the explanatory notes that they've got here, this is what they've got as, you know, what the example is. So that's that text shortcut that I've got in my notes. And that's how I do um, my documentation. So um, if I'm seeing a patient, I'm going to be billing that 10997. I know that looks very tiny. Um, 
but I'll use that as my prompt. So I'll have a look at their care plan, see what we're doing, and then I'll delete what I haven't done with that patient and then document what I've actually um, completed. So it might be that blood pressure check and following up an appointment that was meant to have been done or chasing a report, you know, for that patient as an example. So, yeah, there are situations where some clinics will build that 10997 um, and I've, I've seen it with the 10987 as well with the, the same um, on the same day as the 715. But, yeah, it's for clinics to decide that on their own. As I said, from our point of view, we say no, but yeah, it's it's different from clinic to clinic. Thank you so much, Jane, for, for your thorough <laughs> answers. Um, I'm so glad that you know everything, <laughs> or well, almost everything. No. Um, for everyone else who wants to register for the second session, we've answered the questions. So if you go to Q&A box, and then you go on the top, there's open, answered, and dismissed. In the answer section, you can see the, the registration link. So if you haven't registered, please click on the link, fill up the form, and you'll you'll be good to go. I'll hopefully see you in, in next session. So in interest of, of everyone's time, um, I think we can close up the session. If you yeah. have any questions, please send it, send them through to, to us and we'll be happy to, to answer them as, as best as we can. Um, thank you everyone for joining the session. Thank you, Jane, on behalf of the PHN. As always, you're an amazing speaker. So thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, please stay, answer the survey, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.